Last time we covered our first look into the ancient past of the Star Wars universe. This time, we're stepping into some of the same, same territory chronologically as the later parts of Marvel's original Star Wars series with the truce at Bakura. Not much to say about the book this time. Author Kathy Tyers had published three science fiction novels through Bantam Spectra before writing this one. We'll see a few more short stories from her after this one, before she takes a sabbatical from writing entirely, and won't return to the Star Wars Expanded Universe until the New Jedi Order period. A few days after the victory at Endor, an emergency communication drone from the planet Bakura arrives at Endor, with an emergency message for the Emperor. Bakura is under attack by an alien race known as the Siruk, or Rook, I don't, whatever, an alien race from beyond the Outer Rim. They have the planet's defenders outmatched, and they are in desperate need of assistance. Apparently the Emperor had a deal with these aliens, and now he's dead. So the aliens have determined that the deal is off, and have set out to conquer the whole galaxy, leaving no race in their way. Seeing an opportunity to win some hearts and minds, Luke and Leia persuade the Alliance Council that they should send a relief force. At the very least... Even if they can't get the Bakurans to join the Alliance, they need to prevent a potentially hostile alien race from getting a foothold that could turn their efforts against the Empire into a two-front war. Luke, Leia, and Han set out to Bakura, along with a rebel task force that includes Wedge and Rogue Squadron. On arrival, they negotiate an uneasy truce with the local Republic Imperial Governor and Imperial Garrison Commander, and learn the truth about the Sea Rook. Ru the Sea Rook are reptilian aliens who seek to capture their opponents and intech them, transferring their consciousness into droid fighters, something that humans make for better sources of, of souls for than the other aliens that the s -C brought with them do. Luke works with the commander of the Imperial Forces to prepare a defense, while Leia tries to work with the locals. During a diplomatic feat, Luke meets a local politician named Gariel... Capstan and falls for her. While meeting with her, Luke learns that Gariel's grandmother was part of a local rebel cell, was captured and suffered brain damage in Imperial captivity. Using the Force, Luke is able to heal her. Luke also learns that Gariel is part of a local interest group that worships the Balance, and feels that the Jedi was responsible for upsetting the Balance. Luke also ends up sensing the presence of a mysterious human among the Sirook. Deb Sibuwara. Deb is Force-sensitive, but has received, received no training, and has been kept alive by the C. Rook because his Force sensitivity makes him useful. They have been abusing him and subjecting him to frequent brainwash brainwashing sessions to keep him pliable, though. However, when Luke makes contact with Deb's mind in the heat of battle, it inspires him to try and rebel against the C. Rook in various small ways. However, the Imperial Governor, Willick Nereus, is in the throes of a conundrum. He absolutely, positively does not want the Sea Rook to win. However, 
if the Imperial, if the Rebel forces also win, then he'll lose power because they'll depose, because he'll get deposed and replaced with a elected, uh, Republic representative. So he plans to put in motion a, uh, something that to betray the Alliance at the moment of victory, including infecting Luke with a virulent parasite and turning him over to the Sea Rook in the hopes that the parasite will kill them all. Ultimately, Luke is able to heal himself of the parasites while aboard the Sea Rook ship, and with the assistance of Dev, is able to do enough damage and sow enough confusion that the combined Rebel and Imperial forces can defeat the Sea Rook. Meanwhile, Han, Leia, and Geriel and her grandmother are able to overthrow Governor Narius. The Alliance offers Imperial forces the choice to leave and return home, or for that matter, join the Remnant, or join the Alliance. The commander of the Imperial forces choose to de- chooses to defect the Alliance in order to command Bakura's defense, and Geriel chooses to remain in Bakura to help form a new government, and the remainder of the Re- Rebel forces return to the rest of the fleet. The end. We have the first appearance of in the novels of an alien race from beyond the outer rim, the Sea Rook, which I am probably been mispronouncing the whole time, but that's okay because Sea Rook is fun to say. The Alliance also captures a Sea Rook warship, which they rename the Sibwara. We have the introduction of a religious belief outside of the Force, the Balance. Believers in the Balance, or Balancers, I guess, hold that the power of the Light and Dark Side must both be kept in check. Gariel was a more fundamentalist believer and felt that the Jedi and the Republic threw the Balance out of whack, and consequently she was concerned about the presence of even just one, a single Jedi, Luke. We have our introduction of the Imperial Holonet, a galactic communications network controlled by the Empire, but one which does not quite have instantaneous communications, like a subspace Ansible. The Bakuran garrison couldn't use the holonet to call for help from other garrisons, and the Alliance couldn't use captured holonet transmitters to access the entirety of Imperial communications. Presumably, this is what the Emperor used to contact Vader in Empire Strikes Back. We learned that on some planets... The Empire permitted local forms of government to exist as a means of controlling and pacifying the populace, provided they basically served to rubber stamp the decrees of the Imperial governors. I would compare this to how some Soviet bloc countries would have their own governments, but were still ultimately controlled by Russia. We have our first appearance of battle droids outside of the Han Solo trilogy, but not in the manner that we'd see in the prequel trilogy, not by a long shot. And we learned that Palpatine has had contact with alien races from outside the galaxy, and has been cutting deals with them for various reasons. With Luke, we have his first outing commanding a larger rebel force in battle, not just a smaller group like a fighter squadron. This is now his first canonical attempt to try and teach someone the force. Dev. Canonically... Also, Obi-Wan appears to Luke as a Force ghost for the last time, and he has y- Luke has yet to tell the Alliance of the truth of his parentage at this point. Leia is still in denial over being the daughter of Darth Vader, Anakin Skywalker, but becomes more accepting of this over the course of the book. Anakin's Force ghost appears to her and speaks to her in an attempt to reconcile, but Leia obje- rejects his overtures. Han is a little overprotective of Leia. He tends to put his plans together on the fly, much like Indiana Jones, which I think is a deliberate call-out on the writer's part. Han's not quite ready to propose yet. Now, for Chewie, we actually get scenes from his point of view for the first time. As has been established in other works, he is incredibly mechanically adept, and he really doesn't like 3PO. To the point of weighing whether to having whether he'd have to rep- pair 3PO again against the fact that he'd really like to smack 3PO around. Speaking of 3PO, he is actually somewhat mechanically dexterous and can engage if semi-hack- in semi-hacking if necessary, though he's nowhere near as proficient as R2-D2. He can also wear Imperial Stormtrooper armor in a just convincing enough fashion to accidentally get shot by Chewbacca. And he has a linguistics package that is strong enough to put together a impromptu C-Rook the basic translation package based on an intercepted 
Sirug battle transmissions. This book pretty much retcons the last portion of the Marvel Star Wars run out of existence. No Nagai, no Toffs, nothing. Although part of their material, parts which I've already discussed in the Marvel Star Wars episodes, will be back. But much, much later on. This book was enjoyable to read, but not exactly great. Seeing Leia in her element as a diplomat was wonderful, though considering we get to see Leia as a general in The Force Awakens, I wouldn't have mind seeing more of that aspect of her in books going forward as well. I mean, obviously, all these books were written well before The Force Awakens, so if authors didn't have the idea of General Leia in the first place, then they wouldn't, um, then we're not going to see them being inspired by that by the Force Awakens. But still, it would be nice. It would it will be nice, or would be nice, or will be nice. Time's weird when you're reading old books. Um, to see if other authors take the same cues from the appearance of Leia in Empire, Stri Empire Strikes Back and have Leia the military commander in the future. Now, Tyres, getting back to the book, does a great job of capturing the tra transition in the status quo that we see after Return of the Jedi. The Emperor is dead, now what? In the Marvel comics, the answer to this was form a more conventional government. Here it's strike while the iron is hot to format more open rebellion on Imperial colony worlds, partic particularly the fringe ones, as now the Emperor's Empire is disorganized and power is tri being concentrated in various places. So the new Imperial government, or governments, depending how things play out, will provide more opportunities to bring more systems into the fold. And both in terms of the uh, system military not being able to call for reinforcements because there's no one to call for reinforcements from, and once we start getting organized warlords or a formal government, there's also the issue of do they want to spread themselves that thin and um, controlling all these fringe worlds, or do they want to concentrate their resources in one place? So that is a really good logical thing for the uh, now New Republic government to be doing. And it works out fairly well here in terms of how it's executed. Now, the concept of a balance as a religion is roughly executed. Even Tyres admits in later interviews that the concept is cosmic dualism taken to an absur absurd degree, and absurd is kind of the key word here. That said, I do feel that the concept is still executed better here than it is in the prequel trilogy, with the Chosen One restoring balance to the Force and that sort of thing. Now next time, we're taking on the first book in the Jedi Academy trilogy with Jedi Search. Why not the whole trilogy at once? Well, it's complicated and I'll get into that there. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.